Well, remember we were uh, teaching on the Christian home and child rearing. We already talked about the husband and wife relationship. And don't forget that God instituted three institutions. He instituted the home, government, and the church. And he instituted the home first. And uh, that's because the home is the, the building block of everything. It's the, it's the uh, foundation. And uh, where would we be? We, can't, we couldn't come into this world without the home, right? I mean, well, marriage. Uh, you can come in without marriage, but it's God's design that you come in through marriage. It's God's design that you be in a home. And we come in uh, with, a, with the human characteristics, but we don't come in with knowledge and wisdom and training understanding those things have to be given to us and so first of all we need to have good homes we need to have good relationships with our spouses our children need to be in an environment where they see a good relationship between mom and dad um, that removes fear and that also uh, gives them an example of how to have a good marriage remember that um, the way to have a good marriage is found there in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll not go back and look. But husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So husbands, you should treat your wife the way Christ would treat her if he was her husband. Wives, submit yourselves unto the own, uh, your own husband as unto the Lord. So wives, you should treat your husband as if he was Jesus. Okay, Not that he is Jesus, but how you would treat Jesus. A, wo a woman would never treat Jesus wrong. She, she would never have an attitude towards Jesus or talk back to him or not, not try to fulfill or meet his needs. And Jesus would never treat a wife wrong. Amen. He would never call her names or be unkind or not appreciative of what she did or uh, those types of things. And so our home is to be a heaven on earth because it pictures Christ and the church in eternity. That's why we, we, God doesn't want divorce because we'll never, we'll never divorce each other in eternity. Amen? And so the home. But then we, we get into child rearing. You know, that be fruitful and multiply, he said. And um, it is the job of, uh, of the Christian. It's the job of every parent to train their children. So look in, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment. That uh, may be well with thee, uh, and thou mayest live long on the earth. In verse number four, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Dr. Albert Siegel made this statement, when it comes to rearing children, every society is only 20 years away from barbarism. At some point, that baby that you have is going to become a 20-year-old. And if we haven't done our job from the time that we've gotten them till the time they're 20 years of age, that's where our society is going to go. What we're seeing today as a nation is because we have ceased to start, stop training children. And if you're involved with uh, children much, you'll find that uh, children are not being trained the way they used to be trained. It's just the way it is. And that's not trying to be mean, but... What's sad is that with many of us as Christians, we've also quit training because, you know, it's not easy. Hardest thing you'll do, one of the hardest things you'll do is raise children, amen? And you know what you feel? I get tired. You feel like a, a, a mean person all the time you're raising your children. You think, man, I say no, 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 no. And that's part of it. You have to learn to say no, and you have to be willing to say no. You also need to be willing to have fun and love your children and say yes, too. Amen. It's not all no. He said, 20 years is all we have to accomplish the task of civilizing the infants who are born into our midst each year. He calls them savages. These savages know nothing of our language, our culture, our religion, our values, our customs, or interpersonal relations. The infant is totally ignorant about communism, fascism, democracy, civil liberties, the rights of the minority as contrasted with the prerogatives of the majority, respect, decency, honesty, customs, conventions, manners. The barbarian must be tamed if civilization is to survive. I mean, think about that. You know, what, what, what did you know about democracy until you got into this world and you learned about it, amen? What do you know about communism? Amen. 
And uh, these are things that, uh, these are things that uh, affect our lives. What do we know about right from wrong? Thank God for that. And so we, we've, got a, we've got a real challenge in, in front of us. Our society statistics are pretty bad. 3.6 billion children who began formal schooling in, in 1986, 14% of those children were of unwed mother, mothers. 40% will live in a broken home before they're 18. These are old statistics. Between one quarter and one third are latchkey children. In 19 and 60, there were 393,000 divorces in America. In 1985, it increased to 1 million 187,000 divorces. Births out of wedlock have increased 450 percent in the last 30 years. The world is evil. It is wicked. It is a sin-sick and violent place. We cannot, as Christian parents, allow our children to grow up in this society on their own. 93,000 reported rapes in 1988. These are old statistics. Things are worse. Society suffers. 60% divorce rate, 1.5 1, 1, 1. million abortions per year, 400,000 pregnancies out of wedlock, two, two, uh, 20 million to 30 million cases of incurable uh, uh, gen genital herpes, pedophilia, incest, teenage prostitution at e epidemic levels. Uh, our job is to raise godly Christian children. It's certainly compounded by the rampant nature of sin, the evil in our day. We must take our child training very seriously if our children are going to become ex exemplary Christian young people. And so we got a big task in front of us, and it's not getting easier, and it's not going to get easier. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that society is not going to get better. Uh, the Bible says that evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so that doesn't mean that we have a hopeless situation. It means that we just need to be very diligent about raising our children. Amen. I'm glad I've got mine raised, just to be honest with you. Uh, it was tough in the day and age I raised my children. It's getting tougher. And uh, television has changed. When I was a kid, you had to leave it to Beaver. Father knows best. My three sons. And now you have what? You know, uh, the Simpsons and, you know, and you can go down the line. When I was a kid, the cartoons were Tom and Jerry and, and uh, Roadrunner and, uh, you know, uh, Ricochet Rabbit, Sheriff Bing, 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 Ricochet Rabbit, and, and uh, those types, Mickey Mouse and, and Minnie Mouse and Donald Duck and Daffy Duck, and, and now the cartoons are what? You know, I, I remember that we got rid of our TV, and when I started running a bus route visiting kids on Saturday, I'd go in their homes, I was shocked at all the, all the occult that was in the and the cartoons and all of these superpowers with all these, you know, lightning bolts and these ability to cast spells and stuff. And that's all demonic. If you watch your kids, let your kids watch that. You're letting your kids be conditioned to demonism, the occult, and things that are not real. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, we got a mess. We got a real mess. And, you know, when I was in high school, I had one kid in my senior class I knew that smoked a little, uh, smoked a little marijuana. By the time four years later, I went out to a very small western Kansas town. They had a huge drug problem. I mean, you know, I had, we had a girl in our senior class that got pregnant out of wedlock. She quit school, went away. And now they're pregnant out of wedlock in the middle schools. And there's no shame to it. That's where we're living, okay? And I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm telling you, got a big job ahead of you, so you got to really take this thing serious. You got to spend time thinking. You got to evaluate things. You can't just accept what the world gives. You can't just accept what the television pumps out. You just can't accept what even the public school gives you, and maybe not even what a Christian school gives you. Amen. You can't accept it just because they claim to be experts does not mean they are. If they contradict that book, they are not an expert. They are a witchcraft. Amen. Amen. And uh, I was trained to be a humanist teacher. What does humanism teach? There are no absolute rights or wrongs. You're your own God. You decide what's right for you. You decide what's wrong for you. If it's right for you, then it's right. If it's wrong for you, it's, it's wrong. But nobody else can tell you what's right and wrong. That makes you your own God. That's why everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. I think that was in the Bible before, wasn't it? They did everything that was right in their own eyes, and God had to bring the flood upon them. Amen? And, boy, we're headed to the final judgment. But I'm not going to be accountable for what uh, my other people's children do, but I'm going to be accountable for what my children do. Amen? And I'm not responsible to raise other people's kids, but I am responsible to raise my kids. 
and I'm to bring them up, as you see it there, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, not the world, okay? So my kids, I want my kids to grow up being, uh, uh, being, uh, being a, a cognizant of the Lord, ple- uh, children that are pleasing to the Lord. I, I'm not telling you that I've done a perfect job. Uh, my children have failures, and I failed as a, as a, past, as a parent, uh, but anyway, that's our job. Well, we're looking at the eight pitfalls to avoid in raising your children. Number one, we looked at failing, failure to begin training early. Training early. The Bible says uh, that you're to chasten your, your child while there, betimes while there is hope. That but word betimes means early. As we said in Dr. Uh, Stormer's book, uh, uh, Growing Up God's Way, a child's ba- basic uh, development, his attitudes and his personality is developed by the age of five. I believe this. You have your child under control by the age of uh, five or six, you'll have them under control. I believe that after that, if you don't, you're going to have trouble. I just believe that. Your children, by the time they start school, by the time they get in school, you ought to be able to snap your fingers or do something, and they will listen to you. Amen. And certainly if you wait until they're uh, into the uh, puberty age, you're in trouble. By that time, they have become set in their ways, and uh, they become... They have become where they're not very pliable, amen? You see, they're pliable when they're young. They, you know, the Bible talks about receiving Christ as a little child. What's that talking about? You have to get saved when you're a little child? No, but with the simplicity that a little child accepts things. When your children are young, they accept what you say. But when they get older, they start doubting. They start questioning. You wait until they get older to try to start in, instilling in them truth. And then the Bible says train up a child in the way you should go. The word child there means pre-adolescent. Before they get to be those middle school kids, you need to have them trained. What is trained means brought under discipline. A horse is trained when it does what it's told. When you say to a horse, when you say to a dog, sit, it sits. It's a trained dog. If it doesn't sit, do what it says. So when I, God's saying, I need to get my children under control. They'll do what they're said before adolescence. Because once you're in adolescence, well, it gets tough. Now, I'm not saying you can't, but you're in for a battle, and then you don't need to get upset with your children, and you don't get upset with everybody else. You get upset, look in the mirror, and say, you know what? I should have taken care of this before they got to be an adolescent. When they started showing out, and they knew it. By the way, the moment they know they're doing wrong is the moment to start disciplining and correcting. You know? And that's pretty young. Pretty young. You know? I mean, I got a little Luke. How old's Luke? Two years old, he he'll look at you. He knows what he's doing. He look right at you, knowing what he's doing. So it's time to discipline him. You can't wait, amen. And so uh, do it early. Then the number two, the failure to understand the spiritual forces at work in your child's life. First Peter five eight. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil. And you know the devil. He 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 doesn't wait until your children get to be adults before he starts attacking them. Oh, I'll leave them alone because they're precious little children. No, he doesn't care. He doesn't fight fair. Uh, he, in fact, he fights dirty, amen? In fact, he is trying to destroy. He wants to destroy what God has done. He hates God. He hates God's things. So for, first thing God into was the home. So what do you think the first thing he's going to try to destroy is his home? And what is the most precious thing to a parent is their children. The Bible says when a, when, when a child does right, his parents rejoice. When a child does wrong, he has a heartache and a sorrow to his parents. Amen. He brings his mother to shame when he does wrong. Amen. And so the devil wants to destroy your children because he can get to you through your children. Amen. And uh, my, 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 my whole, my, my, uh, much of my satisfaction in life is to see that my children walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children Walk in truth. Amen. And can I tell you something? At the age that most of you kids are, you have no clue what you're facing. And it's not fair, but when your children become adults, they can either they can either bless you or burden you. They can either make you happy or they can make you cry. They can either take what you've given them and they can and they can they can make it an investment that was worth making or they can make an investment or they can destroy the investment you make. The Bible talks about that see that you take heed to yourself that they might receive a full reward. And I, my job is to make sure my parents get a full reward for the job they did raising me. But I my parents had no control of what I did. I have no control of my 34-year-old son, my 30 or 30 what? 36-year-old son, 33-year-old son, and 30-year-old, 
30-year-old daughter. I don't know what they are. I can't keep track. But I don't have any control. And my kids, I tried to raise them right, but I'm not in control of that. But I am in control of what I raised them. I need to understand that there are satanic forces. I need to see those satanic forces, and I need to have the sense to teach my children about them, warn them about them, and show them and help them to understand the consequences. Amen. And so we got a job in front of us. Well, number three, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll give you the third failure. The first failure, the failure to begin early. The second, the failure to understand the spiritual forces that work in your child's life. And uh, then 1 first, that's, uh, first Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 58 it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye, are you there yet? I'll let you get there. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And look what it says there. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, the, failure, the third failure that we have is the failure to be a godly, consistent example. Therefore, my beloved, be ye steadfast, consistency, unmovable, not changing, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, inconsistency destroys children. I just mean that. I mean, look, uh, if you're inconsistent, you are sending double messages. To Can I tell you, be careful about anything that sends a double message. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And be careful about what you teach your children about certain things that aren't true. I want to be very careful here, but we put our children's belief in something, they find out later that it wasn't really a, a real thing or a real person. Well, wait a minute, what are we doing to them? Well, what else did mom and dad make me believe is true that's not true? What else did mom and dad point me to that wasn't so? There needs to be a consistency in our, Christ, in our Christian life, a consistency in our, in our behavior, a con, uh, Brother Wass, you, uh, brother uh, 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 Barner, Bar Barton used to use this statement, watch. W, watch your words. A, watch your actions. T, watch your thoughts. C, watch your crowd. H, watch your heart. I would say as a parent, you need to be very careful about your words. You be consistent. You consistently use wrong words and don't expect your children to use right words. I grew up in a house that used euphemisms. You know what a euphemism is? It's changing a curse word into acceptable slang. Later in life, God convicted me that that's the same thing as cussing. And you may not feel that way, and God may not convict you, but everybody knows what you mean when you say those words. It's the same way of cussing. And I grew up in that home, and it, so it was very hard for me to break that. So I decided my kids were not going to hear me use those words. They're not going to hear me use those words. not going to hear me say those things. Watch your actions. What, 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 are, you, what, what are you watching on TV? What kind of music are you listening to? Where do you go? What kind of things do you do? I mean, it's a responsibility. Can I tell you that children can rise above their parents? Thank God for that. Because a lot of us here have been condemned. Some of them lost in a saved and grew up in a lost home. You'd be condemned if you couldn't rise above it. But as Christians, we need to understand that God's put a high standard on rearing our children and that we, we should set an example and, and be consistent because if we don't, then, then we can't really look to God in the eye and say, I did a good job, and then we can't get upset with our children when they go, by the way, what, we've heard the statement, what parents do in moderation, children do in excess. Can I tell you that the, the, it's basically this, every de generation degenerates. Everything God created degenerates. This earth is dying, it's running out. Build a house and don't keep it up and see how long it takes. There's a mobile home as we go by to uh, go to uh, Derby. There's a mobile home there. When we moved in two years ago, it was a nice-looking mobile home. Nobody living in it. Now the skirting has blown off. All the siding is deteriorating. Nobody's doing anything to it. It's just happening. It's because they're not maintaining it. Because they're not keeping working at it. Can I tell you, this pastoring, this, this raising children, parenting is a full-time job. And you're going to be worn out by the time you get it done, amen. Because it doesn't, it doesn't get over until, really it doesn't ever get over. But it doesn't get over until you either, that young man takes a hand of a young lady and goes into marriage. Or that you hand your daughter's hand into a young man's hand. And all of a sudden you have to kind of back off and say, no longer my responsibility. You've now started your own home. He's your head now. Or you're the head now. Amen. And so it's a pretty long job, amen? 
And so don't get weary in well-doing. Stay after it. Be consistent. Be consistent. One of the most common problems of parents is the failure to be a godly and a consistent example. Children are especially quick to point out their parents' inconsistencies. And they will. But dad, you said I couldn't do it, but look what you're doing. My daughter used to say this, and, you know, I, I, I got upset with her sometimes about saying it. And sometimes, then I had to finally kind of, kind of get back off. She'd say, I know, Dad, say, do as I say, not as I do. You know, we say one thing, and then we do another thing. That is inconsistency. Now, I do think you need to teach your children that there are some adult things, and there are some kid things. And they need to understand that. Why can't I do this? Because this is an adult thing. When you're an adult, you can do this. Like driving a car. What good way to teach it, okay? I'm not going to give you the keys to the car because you're not capable. When you get capable. So there are those things. But when it comes to right and wrong, there are no inconsistencies. There are no exceptions. It's not, it's not right for a, an adult to do wrong any more than it's right for a child to do wrong. Amen? A lot of times we excuse our wrong because we're adults. Well, I'm an adult. I can handle it. No, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Amen? If it's right, it's right. And if you're an adult, be, be, be a good example and be a consistent example. Go with me to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea, if we can find it here. Hosea. And look with me in chapter 8 of Hosea and look at verse 7. The failure to be a godly and consistent example. Well, I don't want my, hear, my kids to hear curse words out of my mouth. I didn't want them to hear that. You know what that means? It's acceptable. I didn't want my kids to see me at places I wasn't supposed to go because that makes it acceptable. I don't want my kids seeing me attired in a way that wasn't appropriate because that made it acceptable. I don't want to hear my kids, hear my kids, have my kids hear me listening to music that wasn't, accept, wasn't, wasn't appropriate because that made it acceptable. You see, anything I do or say is an example to my children. Paul said to Timothy, be thou an example of the, of, of the believer in, in word, in conversation, and in deed. So very good, a very good lesson there. Isaiah, Hosea chapter 8. And, and that means that some of us are going to have to work hard at controlling our, our emotions. Amen. I mean, when you, when you slam your, ha- your thumb with a hammer, you're going to have to get control. <laughs> say something like stupid you know stupid 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 because that's true it was stupid all right but don't say something else amen hosea chapter 8 and verse 7 thou says for they have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind it hath no stock the bud shall yield no meal it, it, if so be it yield the stranger shall swallow it up i want you to see that first phrase for they have sown the wind they shall reap the whirlwind can I tell you something? That everything we do has a reaping consequence. When you think about your children, how it multiplies. You know, you look through the Bible, you have what we call family curses. Okay? What? It's, it's uh, uh, you know, this, uh, l- let, me use, uh, let me use Abraham and Isaac as an example. Abraham was afraid of, of Sarah's beauty, and so he lied about her. So what does Isaac do? He lies about Rebekah. He just followed his dad's example. Instead of manning up and saying, I'm a man, if you try to mess with my wife, I'm going to bust your face in. Oh, I'm such a whip. They might say something. They might kill me because of you so lie for me. We pass it on. We pass on drunkenness. We pass on foul mouth. We pass on divorce. Anger. You just mark it down. Whatever your, your or my failure is, our sin, you know, our besetting sin, you better start dealing with it because you're going to pass it on to your children. You know, uh, I, I, used to, some, I used to drive down the road with my boys, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I'm a man, and, and maybe I'm a more worse man than other men, but, you know, the way women dress today and the way they walk down the street today, I mean, it causes your head to turn. I used to I used to sometimes drive with my boys and put my hand up like this. I'd see them down there about a block away, and I'd say, oh, God, help me not to turn and look. My boys are here. I don't want my boys to develop the habit of turning and looking at women. You know, they watch you like a hawk, man. 
I mean, my kids would watch me like a hawk. I don't know if yours do, but my kids did. It's like they're watching dad to see what dad's going to say, dad's going to do, how dad's going to behave. Because that's their, that's their example. I, I would like to say maybe that's their hero. And I believe, Dad, you ought to be your children's hero. I believe you are your children's hero. And, and sometimes it's hard to believe that the way they behave. The truth of the matter is when you're not around, they're talking out on the playground. My dad's better than your dad. My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad can beat your dad up. Well, you know, my dad, well, guess what my dad did, amen? They really do. They're your hero. They're, you're their hero. And moms, you're their heroes, heroesses, I guess. Heroines, is that the word you use, amen? And, uh, but but you got to be careful because they're watching you. Um, I saw, I have in my office a little, a, little, uh, a little poem that I keep in my office called Walk a Little Plainer, Daddy. Written by a boy who said, Dad, I need you to walk plainer because i got to follow your steps. And we are mostly what our parents produce in us. And I have a picture of, uh, I have a picture, I used to have a picture, I don't think I have any more. This farm guy, he's in his uh, Oshkosh overalls, he's got on his blue denim shirt, and he's got on his decal seed hat, and he's got on his mud boots, you know, his, his slopping boots. And right behind him is this little boy, he's got on his Oshkosh overalls, his little blue denim shirt, his decal hat, and his, uh, his uh, slopping boots. And dad's walking out through the field like this, and this picture of the little boy doing this, he's taking this step, and he's doing his best to step right where daddy stepped. Because, see, I want to be just like my daddy. They're mimicking you. They're following you. We need to give them a godly and a Christian example. Now, my, my mom and dad weren't perfect. And my mom and dad didn't, uh, didn't attain. They didn't have the kind of preaching that I got later in life, just to be honest with you. Can I tell you, preaching is very important. You know, a lot of times we want a preacher to preach it, preach it, soften it down for us. But unless you have high standard preaching, you won't have high standard living. Amen. May not like it all the time. May get tired of it. May say, I wish that preacher would quit preaching on that. But a high standard living will make you live. A preacher will make you a high standard living. My parents didn't have that like, uh, like, I, like, uh, like I did later. And oh, I remember that my parents, we went to the lake and we went to the lake with people that drank beer and cussed. And, and so we were around people that were drinking beer and cussing. But you know what? I never heard my dad cuss. Never heard my mom cuss. Never saw my mom or dad ever drink a beer. Not one time. Now, I, I would have preferred they didn't take me to those places. But growing up, as I look back on it, I realized that, you know what? It taught me something about the fact that my parents didn't drink beer. I don't have to drink beer. My parents didn't cuss. I don't have to cuss. My parents could live in this world without living like the world. And that's a good thing to teach your, parent, your children. That we can go here and do this, but we don't have to do like they do because we are Christians. We're not to be, we can't be out of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Jesus didn't say take them out of the world. He said keep them from the evil that's in the world. Use those opportunities to teach your children. We should drive down the street, see something happen. I'd say to my kids, uh, look, uh, look at that. That, that God's not pleased with that. That's wrong. And I'd give them Bible verses and tell them. i say, why shouldn't we? We shouldn't do something like that because we love the Lord. And that's a good thing to teach your children. Why do we do what we do? Number one, most important reason, because we love the Lord. Not because there's going to be some consequence. That's something we can learn and teach. Not because Daddy said so necessarily, though that's a good thing. Sometimes I just tell them they say, why? I say, because I said so. <laughs> that's good enough. But wait a minute. What's the main reason why? Because we love the Lord. He, if you love the Lord, keep my commandments. He that loveth me, he it is that keepeth my commandments. I love the Lord. Be consistent. Be consistent. Think about David's sin. What did David's sin cause? It caused Amnon to rape his sister. It caused, uh, it caused uh, uh, Absalom to go in to his concubine. It caused Solomon to have 300 wives and uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines. Well, well, Daddy, I, I personally believe if you read about Solomon, read read the Song of Solomon there, his love story there. It talks about Solomon coming in a chariot with a bed in it. You know what he did? He had like the hippies back in my day. He had a he had a wagon. He had a van. For his immorality. Now, this is a Christian man, Solomon. 
Now, where did it go from one act of adultery to 1,000 wives or 1,000 women? You ever think about that? Did you fellas ever think about that? How in the world did he ever remember their names? If he was going to see all of them in a year, he had to see all three. He had to see three a day. Crazy. Why do you think that happened? I think that happened because his children saw what he did. If daddy did it, then I, I can do it. Amen. What, your, what you do in moderation, your children will do in excess. Well, let's go to the next one. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. We said failure to begin training early. Failure to understand the spiritual forces. Failure to be a godly, consistent example. And then next in Proverbs chapter 22, if you'll turn over there with me. Proverbs chapter 22. And look with me at verse number 6. And by the way, can I say this to you? Say, well, maybe, I've, I, boy, Brother Houston, I've already made a lot of mistakes. Well, you know what? Forget the past and start today. Amen. Aren't you glad that God forgives? And aren't you glad that most of us, most of you in here, your children aren't old enough that just irreparable? Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. And I feel sorry for these folks who get saved late in life and their kids are already heathens. And their heart is broken and they got these kids and they look back and say, it's all my fault. Well, it's not all your fault, but it is part of your fault. But you didn't get saved early enough, so that's all right. God's merciful and gracious. And where does it, what, what do you do in all that situation? What do you do in any situation? Can I give you any situation? Pray. Pray, 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 pray. <laughs> Pray, pray. I mean, if your kids don't turn out good, just pray, 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 pray. That's all you can do. Amen. And God hears all you can do. Well, God hears prayer and does great things. Amen. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. It says, train up in a child in the way he should go. And when he's old and not depart from it. Train up a child. It doesn't say children. It says a child. I think one of the failures that we have is this failure of uh, uh, the failure to love each child individually, unconditionally. And to train them such. One of the things you understand is, is that every child is different. Train up a child. Not chain up children, not train up a family. Train up a child. So I have to take every child and I have to make sure that they get in the right way. That means I have to deal with different things with different children. Amen. I mean, my son Joshua was here last night. My son Joshua was about as compliant as you could be. I mean, he's just a good boy. I mean... You know, I, I hardly ever had to spank him. Usually if I would just show some dis, displeasure, he'd start crying. My son Jeremy, who's a pastor, was strong-willed, stubborn. I mean, it didn't matter. He, I mean, y you, could, you could get on his case and all he did is just stick his chin out and bow his neck and grit his teeth. And you could take the paddle of that boy, and I mean, he was bound, bent, and determined not to get the spanking, and really bound, bent, and determined it wasn't going to cause him to cry. I mean, he was just, mm. I mean, he was a case. I mean, they were different. They had different personalities. They had different likes and different diffs. Like, they're as, they're as different as night and day. Joshua always uh, wanted to be with me working. I was working when I was pastor, and I was uh, fixing vans and working on building things. And J Joshua was going, can I go with you? Can I go with you? Jeremy never wanted to go with me. Jeremy doesn't know, the, doesn't know the work end of a tool if you gave it to him. Amen? He just doesn't know it. He's not interested. Jeremy was interested in shoes and clothes and hair and sports. I mean, that's what he was. He's interested. Yeah, you talk to Jeremy about somebody. He said, yeah, that's the guy with, the, with those Jordans. He knew everybody by their shoes they wore. You know, crazy. Jeremy had this fetish about dirt and about stuff. I mean, if he touched something like this all the time, you know, and, and Jeremy was kind of a little bit, I don't know what I would call it. I think Jeremy was a little bit ADD. Jeremy could never focus well on things. He didn't know how to, he didn't know how to take and break a job down and do it. For instance, my wife would say clean the table. He didn't know how to clean the table. Just didn't know how to do it. You say something to Josh, he'd go do it and get it done. But, but point A, B, C, D, and get it done. Jeremy was, you know, I remember that my wife said, clear the table. And Jeremy didn't know how to do it, so she, she'd get on him. Jeremy told you to clear the table. And he'd start going like this because he didn't know what to do. And I said to her one day, I said, watch this. I said, Jeremy, take that plate. Take it over and put it in the sink. Now, Jeremy, take that plate and take it and put it in the sink. 
And so Jeremy, you had to break everything down for him. You had to tell him what to do step by step. He went to work for a guy that pastored a church not far from Mary, building these metal uh, shelters, you know. With a, and the guy would say to Jeremy, your problem is, is you, you, you can't figure out what, what step to take to get the job done next. That's just the way Jeremy was, okay? And Joanna, she was just a sweet little princess. And so, no, I'm just kidding, amen? And that's the problem with girls. You think they're the sweet little princess, and so you, sometimes you don't give them the discipline and the training they need, amen? But you have to recognize every child is different. You have to love them consistently. I don't love any of my children more than the other, but I love them differently. It's not a different love, but it's a different way of demonstrating that love. And love, a part of love, a big part of love is discipline. He that loveth his child chasteneth him. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. So a great part of our loving, our children, is our chastening. And so I had to chasten them differently. I didn't hardly ever have to spank Josh. Just, hey, it, okay, Dad, I'm sorry. It's done. Jeremy, it was paddling all the time. I had to take him down the basement one day, close the doors, and we had a 45-minute session. Because he was bound. I mean, he was stubborn. He'd blow his back and scream and holler. And I said, this ain't going to fly, buddy. One of us is going to win, and it's going to be me. And I won. And after that session, he became a more compliant and obedient child. Amen? If I had not won that session, guess where that boy would be? He wouldn't be preaching, I'll guarantee you. I had to deal with him different. Now, with Joanna, she was pretty strong-willed, too. And uh, so uh, uh, with her, I didn't have to do as much uh, of, of, the, of the paddling, but I sure had to do a lot of headbutting. Amen? I mean, there was a lot of, no, you're not going to do that. Now, now, you listen to me. There was a lot of that. I had to see their differences. And so remember this, that it's a failure, a failure that we have when we don't love each child individually, unconditionally, and, and train them as an individual, there are some things that you can do to the group, but there's something, you know, I've known different people, and I've been pastoring. I had a lot of people come to me, and, uh, you know, some kids, you know, paddling doesn't do a thing for them. I mean, truth of the matter is, it's like, big deal. You've got to find what does something to them. That may mean grounding them. That may mean moving every toy they got out of their bedroom putting it somewhere where they can't get to it. Say, look, until you start doing right, no toys. With this generation, I think with most of us, you can take that tablet away from them. You're not going to play on a tablet anymore. Till you start doing right, till you listen to mama, till you do what you're told, there's no more tablet. I don't know what you use. My wife did this with our kids one time, and it really had an impact. They still talk about it. They were all behaving bad one day, and she said to them, all right, that's enough. Now you're all going to spank me. And they start crying, no, Mom, no, no, you're going to spank me because I've obviously done a bad job of parenting, and she made them spank them. You know, it did. It changed their whole attitude. Really strange. I mean, I would have never thought of that. I wouldn't have my kids spank me, but she did. <laughs> and you know what? It had an impact. They still talk about it. I still remember that day, Mom. You know, you made us spank you because we were misbehaving. Sometimes you need to go into your kids when they're misbehaving. And let me give you, I got this from a man. I think it's very good. Your children ought to see brokenheartedness over their dis dis disobedience. They don't need to see anger as much as they need to see brokenheartedness over your disobedience. It broke my heart that you did that. I'm mad at you. No, you broke my heart. You see, they really do love you. They really do want to please you. And they really are affected when, it, when they see mom and dad crying and mom and dad hurt that they have done this to parents. I think I mentioned to you the fact that the day my brother got in trouble for drinking and I came home from school and my dad started sobbing and bawling. And in my little heart, I said, I never want to hurt my dad like that. Changed my life. There are many tools and you have to ask God to give you wisdom, and you need to. But it, each deal, each, deal with each child individually, differently. Show them unconditional love, but also realize that they are a child. They're not a mold. They're not children, so to speak, that you just, we're going to cut, cookie cut, cookie cut, cookie cut. You can't cookie cut your discipline. You can't cookie cut your children. Get to know your kids. Amen. Get to know which one is the 
hard-headed one, the stiff-necked, the rebellious, the stubborn one. Get to know which one is the sneaky one. Let me put you this way. My son Joshua was compliant, but he was sneaky. <laughs> he knew that if he was compliant, he wouldn't get in trouble. And then he knew he could go around and, and without letting us know it, he could do something. Amen? And you've got to learn that, too. You've got to learn which one of them is the sneaky one. Amen? You've got to know which one of them is the, uh, he is the lawyer. Have any lawyers in your family? And they want to argue the case, and they're pretty convincing. Amen? You got to know the lawyers, amen. You got to know these things about your children. And then say, God, now how do I do this? I remember helping one man, and he had a son, and, and, uh, and he wasn't a real big disciplinarian. And there, when he came to our church, he pretty much let his kids kind of do what they want to. Um, he actually thought the kind, of, the kind of their funny things, were, their, their, their rebellious things were funny, because he'd kind of been rebellious growing up, and it's kind of his nature. And his wife was kind of a, drill sergeant and those two things in the house were creating a little bit of problems but his one son had a real anger issue especially towards his mother but he had an anger issue when he loses his anger when he loses his temper I mean he would say things he would be mean he would throw things and do things and he would treat his mother like dirt and uh, he, he was in our Christian school and uh, he would lose his temper his mom was teaching Christian school and he would treat her that way and then the administrator would get on him and he didn't take it when anybody got on him and the administrator came and said I'm kicking him out of school I said, brother, let's don't kick him out of school. I mean, this is an opportunity to, to help a young man's life. Amen? I'm not real big on throwing people away. I'm not real big on kicking people out. I'm just real big on trying to find what the problem is and helping them. And his dad came to me and said, brother Houston, I don't know what to do. And I began to give him some counsel about disciplining him and how to talk to him and those types of things. And, and I took the kid. I just decided when he was going to kick him out of school, I said, we're not kicking him out of school. What are you going to do? So I made that kid come every day to school and sit in my office with me. And he did his schoolwork every day in my office. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I went through and we talked about his situation. We read Bible verses about it. And what the young man saw, he saw me when I was studying. He'd see me get on my knees and pray. He'd see me say, pray for an hour, an hour and a half while he's doing his schoolwork. And his dad began to come counseling, and we worked, and we worked, and we worked. And we developed a plan that would help this young man to get over his anger. Well, that young man's in Bible college. No, he's not in Bible. He's in Christian college today. He's a tremendous young man. He's about as loving and kind and, and considerate as you can get. He treats his mother like gold. He loves on her, has a high respect for his dad. He's a hardworking young man. But, but, but I'm trying to get you to see that we had, I had to figure out what made this boy tick. What it was that was was at him and, and, and why these behaviors were coming on and uh, not, not, to, not to back off from disciplining him but to find a way that we could find a discipline or a method that worked for him. Amen. And so work at it and, and realize that you, you, must, uh, you must understand these children. Well, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I said failure to start training early. Failure to understand the forces against your children. Failure to be a godly and consistent example. Failure to love each child individually, unconditionally, and treat them as an individual. And by the way, can I say this? We won't have time, but Isaac and Rebecca had a mistake. Rebecca loved Jacob, and Isaac loved Esau. You cannot show favoritism to your children. If your children know that you love one of the children more than you love them, you are going to have serious problems. Serious problems. You don't have to love them the same, but you need to love them consistently. They need to understand that daddy doesn't love anybody in this family more than he loves me. You know, I don't know if you remember the Smothers Brothers from years back, but they used to say, Mom always liked you best. <laughs> You know, my, 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 ch my sons uh, accuse me of loving my daughter more than I love my sons. You know why they accuse me of that? Because they don't think she got as many spankings as they did. And she didn't get as many spankings as they did. Because I'm going to tell you what, it's different disciplining a girl than a boy. It's just different. You got to figure out how to do it in the right way. Amen. I mean, boys are, boys are ornery. Man, they need it. They need it big time. Girls are mostly sweet. What is that? Girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. Boys are made of something and snails and puppy dog tails. Amen. And that's the way it is. I mean, they're different. Don't you, don't you think girls and boys are different? Don't you think men and women are different? Amen. 
I'm glad, amen, honestly. And that means that we have to learn how to deal with them differently. Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, if you would, with me. You're there and I'm not because I'm talking. Let me get over there. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. In verse 17, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's this failure that we have of conveying our faith to our children. Here Paul says to Timothy, you have known from a child. Boy, what a thing. It's good you have your children in church. You know, it, it'd be good when we get a Sunday school class. It'd be good. I, I love Sunday school. I remember sitting in Sunday school with Jesse Stady and Bruce uh, Schultz and, 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 and different people who taught this little boy uh, stories about the Bible. Can I tell you that Bible stories are very important? When we raised our children, we got John R. Rice's book on Bible stories. And we read one of them every night. It wasn't taking the Bible and blah, 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 blah. It was taking a story from the Bible and reading the story. And then John R. Rice teaching a principle from that story. Man, I love the story of David and Goliath. Amen? I love the story of Zacchaeus climbing the tree. These stories... And, 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 and teaching the Word of God and then taking the stories. Pastor used to talk about acting out the Bible. Remember, Pastor talking about playing Goliath, amen, and having Abby play David and having her swing the sling and that pastor, that pastor falling over. And, and, and your children learning these. Convey to them Scripture. Convey your faith to them. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 tells us to te- talk of these things while we're sitting and in our house, while we're in the, in the field, we're to teach our children the faith. We're to teach our faith with diligence. We're to teach our children uh, and communicate. And I think you know that. I don't spend a lot of time on this, but, but do it. It says to write them up on the house. Put them up on the, the, door, the doorposts. Put Scripture verses. My kids were in a Awanas program, learning verses. Little cubbies. We are... We are Awana cubbies, da 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 da, and they didn't start out learning the whole verse because they're too small to learn that. But they learned a phrase like, you know, "Be ye kind." That's a good thing to teach from the Word of God. Amen. You know, and teach them the Bible. Have have memorization for your children. Have your children memorize Scripture. Teach them your faith. Convey your faith to them. Can I tell you this? The greatest way to convey your faith is just to be consistent in your faith. I already mentioned it. Can I, can I just say this to you to commend you? One of the greatest things you're doing for your children is being faithful to church. Faithfulness. God is looking for faithfulness. You know, he, he not, he's not looking for you and I to be better than anybody else. He's looking to be the best we can and to be faithful. You know, I, my parents were not perfect parents, but one of the things in my family, you knew this, we're going to church when the doors are open. Never on a Saturday night was the question discussed, are we going to church, I mean a Sunday night, are we going to church tonight? Never was it discussed on a Wednesday, are we going to church tonight? If we were home, we were going to be in church. Now, if we weren't home, then there were times when my parents didn't take us to church. I think it was a failure. When I raised my kids, if we weren't home, we still went to church. Because what they taught me a message was, you go on vacation, you don't have to go to church. Well, that's not true. You go to Aunt Susie's, and Aunt Susie's more important than church. No, nobody's more important than church. Nothing's more important than church. Amen. Why well, I say that, brother, because Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Because Christ instituted the church. He's the chief cornerstone, and the apostles are the foundation. And he told us not to forsake it. So it must be pretty important. And he said, if you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. So if you say, I love my family more than I love church, and you're saying, I love my family more than I love what Jesus died for. That's not true. can't be that way. But we're just not missing church. Uh, We went to, uh, we went on our 25th anniversary, we went to Maine. 
And uh, on Wednesday night, we got into New York City at about 4 o'clock, and we went out to the Statue of Liberty. And we got on the last boat that came out there about 4.30 or so. And it took us over a half an hour to just get out of the parking garage. You want to have an experience, go to New York City during rush hour. Crazy. And we were crossing into New Jersey, and it's starting to get church time. And I'm frantic. Where are we going to go to church? But we're not missing church. Man, I mean, I'm on the phone calling places and trying to find some place open. I found a Baptist church in some town was open. We pulled up there right at church time and ran downstairs. And this is the kind of church it was, a pastor and four elderly ladies down there studying the Bible. Nobody else came on Wednesday night. Then they showed up for choir practice. Everybody showed up for choir practice, but they didn't come for Bible study. You know what I'd have done if I had that church? I'd have torn that thing up. I'd have thrown a big bomb in there and blown that thing up. You're not singing in the choir. You don't come to sun on Wednesday night service. You can just forget that garbage. This ain't about entertainment. Amen. Man, you're crazy. Well, you know, maybe so. But I tell you what, that's why our churches are in the trouble they're in. Because we have no standard or backbone or conviction. Preachers are afraid to t say, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's going to be here. You know, you can like it or lump it any way you want to. Amen. I'm trying to be kind. Amen. But there are certain things that just have to be. And singing in the choir is not something you're going to do if you're not going to be faithful to the house of God. You're not going to do it. Amen. Well, we went to that Bible study. We got out of there. We drove all night because we couldn't afford a motel. <laughs> I'm telling you, they're over 100 bucks there. Amen. I don't pay 100 bucks for a motel nowhere. Amen. If you want to, go ahead. You got the money. You want to, go ahead. But I ain't doing it. Amen. I'll go to Motel 6, pay $29.99. Amen. Long as there's no bed bugs and they made the sheets and everything clean. Amen. Amen. Well, anyway, I gotta, I'm just rambling. We need to close. Amen. But convey your faith to your children. From a child, Timothy knew he's a Christian. You know, it's sad to me. I knocked doors in Jeff City. I met a lot of young people, young, young college-age kids and high school kids. Go to church anywhere? No. Nope. Ever gone to church anywhere? No. Nope. Know anything about the Bible? No. Nope. If I could take the Bible and show you some things, we'd be interested? No. You know where that came from? Parents not taking their children to church. Look, I'd rather have some kid that grew up in a Catholic church than some kid that didn't grow up in church at all. Because I can say to him, hey, you know what? I know you believe the Bible. Now, they don't believe it totally, but they do believe in the Bible. I said, I know you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And they have something upon which to build a foundation. But these kids that are being taught with no God, no church, man, we're in trouble. And we're having trouble reaching them because their parents didn't do the job of putting a faith in them when they were children. Father, thank you.